Hello and welcome to The Interface, the Hindu's podcast to make sense of the accelerating pace of change underpinned by technology. I'm your host, John Xavier. Today's episode was recorded on the sidelines of Google Cloud Next 2025, where I caught up with Umesh Vamuri, Google's Google Cloud's VP for Strategic Missions and Partnerships. Umesh's team focuses on pushing the boundaries of what's possible by scaling up nascent yet powerful technologies. Join us as we explore how they shaped the future of entertainment experience at the Sphere in Las Vegas with the Wizard of Oz recreation, a project that reveals just how far ambition and technology can go together. So, uh, Umesh, thanks for taking the time out. Glad to have you on the uh, Interface podcast. Thank you. Um, so, Omesh, I want to kick it off directly. Could you, uh, your role is quite interesting. It talks about strategic missions and also uh, speaks about uh, some level of, you know, scaling up. So, g- give me a, a, a kind of a sketch about your profile and, you know, what you do at Google Cloud. Sure, happy to. Um, so, first, I've uh, I've been in uh, Google uh, and in Google Cloud for almost 13 years now um, and so have seen the, the growth of the organization. And so, what we decided to do, um, my organization is called strategic missions and partnerships. And what that really does is that focuses on three different things. So number one, uh, it focuses in terms of the partnership aspect. Uh, We enter into long-term partnerships with our customers that uh, can bring cloud, but also can bring other parts of Google to the partnership. So my team works on establishing those partnerships, identifying use cases with those customers with the goal of ultimately helping our customers grow uh, and help them grow their top line, help them grow uh, in aspects of the business. So that's number one. Uh, Number two, there's a number of areas of technology that are still uh, nascent and early, uh, and we incubate uh, that technology uh, so we can then ultimately help grow it and build it in the Google Cloud portfolio. So uh, in areas of federated learning, Google distributed cloud, we've had historically, there's different areas of technology. So that's a, a second piece. And then the third piece I focus on is broad or geo expansion strategy. So how we think about how we work with customers around the globe. Um, So it's it's fully global, um, which uh, uh, use cases for which industries and which parts of the world and how do we bring value as as fast as possible. So my role is 100% with customers uh, all the time, uh, focused on their growth strategies uh, and what missions we need to undertake to enable their growth. That's interesting. So because your role is global, how do you kind of uh, look at strategic options among different other countries or regions? You know, how do you Uh, get into that zone. Yeah, we don't really look at it so much geographically as we look at it, uh, customer partner, as I call them, partner by partner. Uh, I think every organization is going through some form of transformation right now. And that uh, transformation could take several forms. forms. Typically, what I look for is I look for the uh, transformation they're driving, driven at the very top of the organization, number one. So we don't typically look, is it a technological change, but more of how are they thinking about their business as a whole? So typically a CEO-driven transformation. Number two, we like to look at what's the impact they want to have through the transformation. So impact to save money, operational efficiency is important, but those are kind of secondary effects I look for. What I'm looking for, how do they better serve their consumer? What value are they actually providing to that consumer? And how are they changing the experiences of of, uh, their users? And we look at that, uh, we look at those two things, but then this is where I think it's really interesting. Then we look at, is the nature and the scale of their problem something that is Um, very interesting for our technology portfolio. Um, Do we get to advance our technology through the partnership? Uh, We've made a lot of announcements here, and some of the announcements we've made here have come through some of these partnerships we've had that maybe have evolved our AI models rapidly or have evolved uh, the use of some of our technology. So I I look at those three uh, dimensions, uh, typically on a partner-by-partner basis. Given that you speak about partnership, which is also part of the role that you play, uh, how important or rather, you know, what kind of role did you play with the whole sphere and wizard of oz thing could you give a, a sense <laughs> yeah we've, yeah. T- we, we've talked about that uh, quite a bit yes so uh, my team has been involved uh, the the entire way and we've been involved in in sort of figuring out how do you structure uh, an arrangement of how we work 
when we, as you've heard probably in all the descriptions, when you don't even know if it's possible to do the things that we were being asked to do. So um, it's not as though you can take our standard consulting or grade engagement or service engagement, just say, go do this, and you know it's going to work. That required bringing together Google DeepMind, our research arm, Google Cloud, uh, multiple third parties, and deploying resources in a way that is, um, uh, is, is a bit atypical for us because you are working for months on end, not even knowing if the science or the technology exists to solve the problem that's there. So my team had a role in scoping and defining how we are going to work together helping deploy the resources. And then candidly, it's a little bit of the boring part, understanding contractually, how do you create an agreement with uh, with organizations when you're not even sure the technology, in fact, is yeah. is ready to be used. So that's that's how my team. Yeah, works. I mean, it's quite interesting. I mean, I, I want to go a little deeper sure. on the Wizard of Oz, uh, Oz idea sure. itself. Uh, how did it even come into your world? Like, for instance, was it you kind of co-building it with the overall team or it came as a kind of, an inquiry project, and then you started building in a house. Yeah. I can speak to how I first was exposed to it. I know yeah. others were exposed to it before I was exposed to it, <laughs> but I can speak to my experience. So um, my first experience is I was asked to attend a meeting uh, in California with Jim Dolan, the, the CEO of Sphere. And I didn't really candidly know what exactly I was walking into. I've had um, on a every, multiple times every week, I'm based in California. I have uh, multiple customers and partners come in with big visions and my job is to help unpack the vision of what's their vision, how do they want to grow. This was unlike anything I had seen before because I read the material, I'd come in and he started explaining to me what, the, again, the physical structure didn't exist at the time. It was a vision. And said, oh, even the sphere was in there. No, okay. no, there was no. It was wow. still, a, we're, we're starting construction on this thing. Wh- which year was this? Uh, 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 it was a few. I, I don't want to misquote the date, but it was. Yeah, uh, it okay. was uh, year, year. Any... Two plus years ago, for sure. Wow. Uh, when I first when I first became uh, aware so of this. So there was a form factor for you to really think, you know, what this is going to get. Well, there was, there was a presentation of, of slides and a representation presentation I could, you know, just look at on a slideshow, but it's not, it wasn't something I could um, fly to loss because again, um, from a timing perspective, I think a lot of what they've done started during pandemic time, uh, you know, for, for the right. sphere, but you couldn't travel, you couldn't physically come see it. And all the times I'd been to Vegas, I had not come, you know, I, it was before the pandemic. So I could not physically see what this thing was. And even, even you can see it today, even if you see it from the outside, it's hard to imagine oh. what is it inside that you're really looking at. Truthfully for me, um, it, it took quite some time to understand. And maybe it's just my very simple mind of, okay, it's, it's sort of movie theater. The first thing I had was like, okay, wait, it's sort of movie theater, sort of roller coaster, sort of experiential. I couldn't quite um, fathom. But then what really occurred to me when it really hit me that something was different here is when they started talking about the dimensions of both, everyone talks about inside, the dimensions inside, the screen, what will be projected. And I immediately started to think about the resolution that they were talking about at the size that they are talking about. I don't, I couldn't quite understand how is that possible. And then the second piece that I thought was interesting was the outside display. Um, the the custom lighting, what's built on the outside, the fact that there was uh, a project, you know, the projection, and they wanted to be able to use the physical outside space to display a number of things. So when this first came to me, my immediate first thought, again, because think of this was a little bit in a sort of a pre AI is popular world almost. It was a bit, you know, we were still in a world where I was thinking just the sheer volume of compute, the sheer volume of analytics you need to do. It, it was sort of, it, it was kind of staggering to me. But then w- once I kind of uh, went past that, right, again, because the first iteration of this was not the Wizard of Oz that everyone was has been talking about this week. The first iteration, we weren't talking about something like the Wizard of Oz. We were talking about hosting music concerts and performances and other shows that would have these rich beautiful displays that all ha- required compute AI and other things behind them, but it wasn't the reimagination of a, of a, of a, of a wizard of Oz. Right. That's a slightly different 
these are two different problems, right? <laughs> the Wizard of Oz is how do you maintain the integrity of this classic and, and do it justice and do honor uh, to this as it's expanded into this new form factor and right. world. That problem was a little bit more of how do you truly create new immersive experiences? If someone's going to a physical concert, how do you bring them into the venue and then immerse them in the environment with content in a way that's logical, that makes sense, but yet there's maybe a physical band that's still performing in front of you. So it was a lot of thinking right. through, these are different human experiences. Yeah, yeah. And so how's the human react? So that's how it all kind of came to me. Got it. That's, that's quite interesting. I mean, there was no AI as the way we knew, knew it, and there was no sphere, and still you had to kind of, you know, put together like a group. How, how did you go about that process? Yeah, so that, that process was actually pretty straightforward, simply in the sense that um, we knew that the, we knew AI would be central to this. And, and one of the things that we have inside of Google Cloud uh, is we have uh, a, what we call an AI black belt team. And that, that those are our deepest experts who work with uh, um, customer teams. So it was a very simple first step was to deploy that team directly with the engineers from the sphere and the partners that we also worked with to try to understand and imagine the the challenges that were there. And there was a whole host of them, but that it was, and then it all really started from there. Right. And uh, I just want to touch upon two uh, yeah. questions at the same time. One is like, how different is Google's cloud uh, when it comes to, you know, the, the partnerships that you're building from possibly your competitors? Could you give a, the, your competitive landscape? Yeah, I, and I'll, I'll give it in the context of where we are now. I, I think the, the significant differentiation that I would uh, point to, which uh, Thomas and others talked about today is, um, and, and I've seen this, I think this is what's so attractive about the partnerships that we're in is, um, without going too far into the technology is, to, to really comprehensively solve some of the problems we think that AI can solve, our customers have to have direct access to every element that is required to be able to, from a technology perspective, to be able to solve those. So there's a lot of folks that talk about models. There's different people that talk about agents. There's different people that talk about chips. But when you really look at what we have been doing inside of our cloud, having access to our own first party chip and TPUs as well as third parties that we have, having the AI platform uh, uh, with the uh, safety and security built in with Vertex, having an agent framework to build and compose the, the uh, to compose agents, having our own first party agents, supporting multiple models from multiple providers, not just uh, Google's uh, models, uh, having the full cloud stack and the ability to build uh, applications. One of the reasons these partnerships um, are, I think, are so attractive is because we have all of that inside of our cloud. Um, if you look elsewhere in the industry, others have elements of that. And I think that's a very different place than where the cloud provider conversation was four or five years ago, when the conversation was about compute and storage and networking, all still very, very important. But those services are something that every cloud provider has, and every cloud provider has advantages and disadvantages in, in each of those. When we moved to AI, we saw this as a real opportunity because we've had a, a decade of implementing AI systems inside of our company. And our job is to figure out how to externalize everything we've done internally. How do you make that available to our customers? And then it was very evident quickly that at the networking layer, at the hardware layer, at the AI hypercomputer and machine, at the model level, at the software level, at the app agent level, we have the entire stack. And so that's what draws most of our, our, our partners to, you know, when I say partners, people who want to enter into long-term agreements with us because they know right now, maybe they have a set of real key projects they want to build against. That's great. But they also have a long-term vision of what AI can do for them. And they recognize Google has all of the components right. that are required right. for us to do that. Right. Uh, on that note, what are some of the next things uh, that you know your partnership team is working on, or is there any kind of a similar episode like the Wizard of Oz that's going on where you? We have, yeah, we have. Uh, stay tuned. There's lots of partnerships that we are <laughs> that we are working on. I think the biggest thing I would point to right now is um, the industry as early as it relates to to uh, to agents. We feel we're in a very good place, and I'll just spend one minute on this. Um, and I think this is going to be profound. What's what what's coming now? So we've always viewed. Uh, AI fundamentally is something that I, I always refer to it as um, every person in every aspect of your life having a personal assistant that's simple and uh, helpful. 
That's the simplest way I think about what AI can do. So if you're going to school, you have an assistant that can help you with education and healthcare. You can have an assistant that helps with healthcare, so on and so forth. And so when we think about that, where the industry has been over the last two years is we're almost sort of on the third version of the way people are looking at AI. The first version was everyone came out with models. Everyone was talking about models. We called models. We prompted them. They gave us answers back. Then people said, we're going to build applications. Okay. But those applications are still calling models and we're getting response back. Where we are is at this profound moment where there are very complex reason-based workflows. Uh, think about things as simple as uh, uh, checking out in an e-commerce process. We get process. We gave a great example today of a, customer, a, a customer service. Uh, think about we're just at the start of that in the composition of agents from multiple providers, potentially running on multiple clouds with data everywhere inside of an enterprise in a heterogeneous environment. It's not hard to imagine a world very, very quickly where that personal assistance vision that we have, uh, you saw pieces of it today and what was shown in that. So I think before we talk about the jump to what's the next big thing, it is really about helping our customers understand how to build, put these agents together on one side to drive maximum optimization and efficiency inside of their organization. But on the other side, it is about creating these really differentiated, beautiful, simple experiences for their customers. And we believe that's the key. If their customers are now delighted in their banking process, in their retail process, in their healthcare process, that's what we're striving for. That's what we're trying to help our, our, our most significant partners do. And we think that's the next big thing that's out there. Great. On that note, thank you so much. Thank for you so time. much. Amish, it was fantastic getting to know all the things that, that was going on before the Wizard of Oz started <laughs> and a lot of other things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to the Interface Podcast. For more such episodes on technology and innovation, Tune into the interface on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Do share your comments with us at the interface at thehindu.co.in. To keep yourself updated with the latest tech, please go to thehindu.com or follow us on all social media platforms. Thank you.